Yeah, I'll wait a few Jesus. seconds. That's great. Ready to go? Okay. Yes, you can. Yes. So my name is Marcus Fisk, and I'll be talking about the development of grid therapy capabilities on the XRAD preclinical radiotherapy system. My supervisors were Martin, Pejman, and David. So I'll, this talk will go through a background, uh, an introduction to the project, a literature overview, and methods and results, discussion and conclusion, followed by future work and applications. So grid therapy is a form of spatially fractionated radiotherapy, where instead of delivering a uniform dose to the tumor, the dose is split into multiple beamlets, uh, uh, delivering a heterogeneous dose distribution. This can be seen in the figure on the right, where the uh, uh, uniform dose is compared to the, the grid dose. Uh, it's particularly for large radio-resistant tumors and typically delivered in a single fraction with 10 gray delivered to the peaks at depth of dose max or, or to the surface in a KV beam. This large peak dose is possible due to the reduced volume of, of normal tissue that is irradiated. Uh, and this method has a, an improved therapeutic ratio in some situations, particularly for radio resistant tumors. And this uh, is uh, the radiobiology that tries to explain this is these three effects here. So the first is bystander effect, which relates to the observation that par partially irradiated cells ex can experience um, effects such as DNA damage or cell death. Uh, in response to signals received from the, the peak uh, peak regions. Uh, with respect to tumor vasculature, uh, it's the high peak dose that is characteristic of, of grid therapy that uh, is postulated to cause endothelial apoptosis in the tumor vasculature, uh, and this is to a greater extent than in conventional therapies. There's some debate whether this is a good thing or not. Uh, on one hand, it can increase tumor hypoxia for follow-up treatments, on the other hand, it can cut off supply to the tumor uh, cells leading to cell death. Um, so radiotherapy is typically considered an, an immune suppressant. However, uh, there are some studies that show that the uh, that grid therapy can actually increase the immune um, response to a tumor. And interestingly, this can also spread uh, to uh, sites outside of the treatment field leading to abscopal effects. So the interplay between these three effects is largely unknown. So further research into optimizing the grid treatment is needed. Uh, so a background of Monte Carlo. Uh, so Monte Carlo is a um, is used in medical physics to solve the particle transport equations, the stochastic method, uh, and the the process begins uh, with. Uh, a particle traveling in a randomly sampled distance to its next interaction point. Um, when, when it's at the next interaction point, the interaction uh, type is de is determined based on the likelihood of each interaction in the in the medium. The energy loss or the nature of the secondary particles produced will be determined uh, based on another sampling event. Then the secondary particles uh, will be simulated in the same way. So this process is continued until each particle has fallen below a threshold energy or left the area of interest. So the XRAD uh, is a self-shielded orthovoltage image guided radiotherapy system. It has a cone beam CT system for accurate tumor positioning, thanks to the flat panel detector seen there. Uh, it has a set of interchangeable collimators as shown on the right. And uh, these are all incorporated into the uh, smart plan treatment planning system. So smart plan is uh, a Monte Carlo based uh, treatment planning system where the CT scan is used to guide the, the material definitions within the small animal patient. So some literature uh, related to preclinical grids. So Timothy Johnson and others produce grids by machining three millimeter le uh, thick lead sheets as shown on the left here, uh, uh, the grid was attached to the XRAD collimator uh, using a 3D printed apparatus shown here on the right. So Codra and others produce grids from tungsten filled uh, PLA 3D printing filament, and this grid was attached to the XRAD in a, a similar manner to the, the previous paper. So these grids produce very low peak to valley dose ratios, 
uh, being only 1.8. Uh, so these grids weren't uh, investigated anymore. This uh, Azure and others um, produced a grid dose distribution by using a fixed 12 millimeter diameter collimator and actually moving the stage uh, to produce this uh, using a robotic arm to produce the, the grid dose distribution. So I had three aims of this project. The first one was to create a grid insert from an attenuating material with uh, diverging holes. Uh, the second was to simulate the X-ray tube collimation setup and, and grid insert when it was attached to the X-ray uh, using a um, Monte Carlo simulation and then to validate this using film measurements. The third was then to implement this Monte Carlo into the smart plan treatment planning system. So a brief chronological order of my project. So I started with the simulating uh, the grid collimators uh, in order to uh, guide the design of the physical grids. So this started by modeling the X-ray tube based on the drawings supplied by the manufacturer on the left here. Uh, so the tube has a nominal voltage of 225 kV. It has a 0 0.8 millimeter beryllium window, a 30 degree tungsten target, and there was also a 0 0.3 millimeter copper therapy filter in place. So th modeling the uh, 10 millimeter isocenter collimator that comes with the um, XRAD and has a its own um, face base from the manufacturer that's incorporated into the uh, treatment planning system. This was used so that um, our geometry could be verified by uh, or the source parameters and the, the geometry could be fine tuned so that our geometry, we knew our geometry matched what the manufacturer had simulated. So this was done by uh, comparing the dose distribution in a, in a water uh, block between our produced phase base and the manufacturer's phase base. And then the uh, X-ray tube source parameters were adjusted until the best match uh, was observed between the distributions. So following on from this, the fine-tuned source and X-ray geometry parameters were used for the rest of the project. Uh, and the next step was to model the variable collimator, which is shown on the left here. And this was um, where the grid would sit. You can see there's a slot where the grid insert would fit into. Um, and the Monte Carlo model of, of this is shown on the right. Now, in order to simulate the various grid arrangements, a phase space was scored directly uh, above where the grid would sit, as shown by the red phase space there. And this allowed us to place that phase space directly above a gr uh, various grid inserts and then simulate that on a block of water. So this allowed us to save, uh, save time and not having to, to simulate the X-ray tube uh, uh, particles every single time we change the grid arrangement. So the whole radii ratio of open to blocked area and the maximum field size was changed uh, for a total of 180 different grid arrangements and their peak to valley ratios and output factors were uh, analyzed. So following this, the, the grid with a, with a good compromise between the output factor and the peak to valley ratio was chosen for the uh, uh, manufacturing stage. So on to how these grids were manufactured. So the first step uh, was using a Prusa Mini 3D printer uh, with a PLA filament to produce the uh, grid module as shown in step one. Uh, and you can see the diverging nature of the, of the cones there. Uh, step two contains the grid insert. And after placing the grid module from step one into the insert in step two, we have step three, which forms the template, which we plan to uh, create a CeraBend, um, CeraBend grid that looks exactly like that. The, um, in order to do this, a mold out of a firm addition cure silicone was used. Uh, this was used for its high heat resistance and it, its ability to produce dimensionally accurate parts. So the uh, template from step three was placed into this grid, grid bath 
shown in step four. And to stop the uh, silicone from rising around the edges of the mold and to instead be forced through the, um, the holes at the center of the grid, this grid push tool in step five was designed. And uh, the result, you can see the, the silicone being forced through the holes in the right of step five. Step six shows uh, the uh, grid or the mold as it's secured in place. Step seven shows the, the grid uh, or the mold after it's cured and cleaned up a little bit. At this stage, uh, the silicone is quite uh, flexible, so removing it from this uh, template uh, plastic part is, is relatively easy, and you get the uh, final mold in step eight. So the next part was to pass the CeraBend into this mold. So an aside on what CeraBend is. So CeraBend is an alloy of uh, lead, bismuth, and, ten, uh, and tin, and it has a melting point of 96 degrees Celsius. Its high atomic number uh, makes it great for attenuating photons in this energy range. So that's why it was used. The first step in the casting process was heating the, um, the mold for approximately one minute using it. Hot gun. Uh, the mold was then placed on the vibration table, uh, shown in step two. Uh, while the cerebin was uh, being poured into the mold, a high amplitude, high frequency setting was used, and this uh, ensured that air bubbles trapped in the bottom were removed, as well as allowing the cerebin to form in between the, the, the cones of the grid distribution. So step uh, three and four shows the uh, result after casting and you can see there are some imperfections that will have to be removed so these were the imperfections were removed by uh, the using the following setup shown in step one so a router uh, shown in step two was was used and passed over the the surface of the grid uh, and this removed layer by layer in an even fashion and you can see the result of this in step three the final um, finishing was performed using a sheet sander as the, uh, the grid lay in this recessed hole. The final product of this is shown here. So the, the center shows the grid field inside of the variable collimator. And then on the right, you can see the thickness of the grid uh, just allows it to fit into the slot. So this allows a re precise repeatable setup. And then you'll notice on the left, the 11 millimeter square field, and this was produced uh, so that this the simulation uh, um, geometry and uh, the simulation as a whole could be verified using a, a simpler geometry than starting off with the grid field. So to evaluate the uh, manufacturing method, uh, the uh, grid was scanned and using a circular Hoff transform in MATLAB, the radii of the holes was assessed. So you can see in the central grid uh, or the central box plot, uh, the average radii of the holes was around 0 0.71 millimeters, where we designed them to be 0 0.7 millimeters. The center to center spacing as well, the uh, measured spacing was around 2.43, whereas the design spacing was 2.4 millimeters. Uh, now, thanks to Munir, we managed to take a 6 MV portal image of the grids uh, to assess the uniformity and to see if there uh, were any significant air bubbles that were trapped in the insert. So the visible imperfections shown in by the, the circles there uh, are more likely caused by defects in the portal imager rather than defects in the grid. So now onto the film measurements. The films were cut with the Flux beam box uh, available from Flux 3DP. And as shown here, the, the films were labeled in the bottom left corner by a cutout number, as shown by an example on the right there. The film calibration pieces were two by two centimeter squares, and these were placed on top of a solid water phantom, uh, which is shown on the left here. This uh, phantom was produced using uh, PLA 3D printing filament and had a 93% infill setting. And this was designed to match the electron density of water and was based off the work of the UWA 3D printing cluster. Uh, the irradiation setup is shown in the middle there. 
Uh, for the calibration, the 40 by 40 millimeter collimator, which is actually different to the one shown there, uh, was used to deliver a known dose to each um, separate slice of calibration uh, film. And you can see these, these known doses on the right there. For the film irradiation, the film slices were 35 by 35 millimeters. And, and these were placed one by one between each layer of the PLA phantom, uh, as you can see on the, in the elongated uh, image on the left. Uh, the PLA phantom uh, was designed so that uh, all the layers locked in place and this limited the translational motion. Uh, now the film stack uh, was placed uh, with the surface at the ISO center and irradiated for 126 seconds which is equivalent to a 40 by 40 open field dose of 8.01 gray. This was done for the grid field and the 11 millimeter square field as well. Um, so with the film scanning, this was done on the Epson Expression 12,000 XL scanner. Uh, there were two warm up scans done, followed by three scans of, of the films, each at uh, a resolution of 300 dots per inch. The, Films were originally scanned in groups of 11 on the scanner, as shown on the, on the image on the right. Uh, however, lateral scanner effects made the results unusable for a 3D reconstruction. So the films are rescanned one by one, each lying in the center, and the calibration procedure was also performed again. So the result of the film calibration for the red channel is shown here which uh, relates the scanner pixel value to the um, uh, dose in gray. Uh, so the there was a double exponential fitted to the data points, and this can be shown uh, fit uh, displayed on the graph. So with the film processing, uh, to correct for the orientation in which the, uh, the films were scanned on, on the scanner, uh, edge detection uh, or MATLAB edge detection was used to find the angle of the left and right edges. And by using uh, using a, a MATLAB image rotation algorithm, the films uh, were rotated so that they were square, as shown on the right here. Uh, next, the film was cropped to a size of 25 by 25 millimeters, and they were centered at the center of the dose distribution using a circular Hof tra uh, transform to determine the location of the, um, uh, the central this dose distribution. Now, this did mean that any systematic shift in the dose distribution with respect to the ISO center was lost. Uh, so future work, we'll, we'll have to verify this. Uh, next, the film, proceed, uh, the film was uh, converted from pixel value into dose using the calibration function, as shown on the left. Uh, and then a 2D median filter of size 10 by 10 pixels was used to remove noise in the image. Uh, linear interpolation along or between the film slices along the depth dimension was, was done, and the process is visualized in the left figure. Uh, the result of this is shown on the right for the grid field and the 11 millimeter square field. You can see that 11 film slices have been converted into uh, values for 50 different depths. Now on to comparing the Monte Carlo results to film. So first of all, the Monte Carlo simulation was modeled to accurately resemble the irradiation setup. So this was done by incorporating the PLA water block into the simulation. And this was uh, had a little bit of mostly PLA some air and also the contribution due to the gas chromic film layers uh, and the percentages here are expressed by weight. So then the Monte Carlo simulations were also median filtered by an equivalent size to the film measurements and the results uh, are shown here. So these are, this, um, are the X profiles comparing the 11 millimeter square Monte Carlo results to the film. So the crosses correspond to the film measurements and the simulation uh, are the uh, solid lines. Uh, the simulation uh, was normalized so that the maximum lined up with the maximum at the surface of the, the film. 
and you can see the X profile for three different depths within the um, dose distribution shown. The axis below shows the gamma index scores for the criteria of 1% uh, and 0.5 millimeters uh, for a range of three depths as well. You can see that uh, the majority of points are, are passing this gamma analysis. And uh, now the uh, percentage depth dose. So the percentage depth dose was calculated by the, the maximum dose at, at each uh, depth slice. Uh, and you can see the, the film in red, the Monte Carlo in, in blue. The error bars correspond to 95% confidence interval in the Monte Carlo simulation. And the percentage difference uh, lies within 5% for all data points. Onto the uh, grid field. Um, so the, this graph is showing the Y profile comparisons for a range of, of three depths as well. Uh, it's uh, in the same way as the uh, 11 millimeter square was compared. Um, the normalization was, was also done to the uh, maximum dose uh, at the, of the film surface. Uh, so the X profiles are similarly shown. You can see that the gamma is also passing, and the, the gamma is only uh, shown for a, um, above a 10% dose threshold uh, based on the surface dose. Uh, there was a, a slight problem with the uh, percentage depth dose uh, compared uh, for the grid field. So as you can see, after about three centimeters of depth, the uh, Monte Carlo simulation is either overestimating the dose uh, at depth or the field measurement is underestimating the dose. So it's a, a little bit unclear as to as to which one that was. There was only one field measurement performed. So ideally, uh, we, we could use another set of field measurements to verify this, but that is left for future work. So the gamma analysis was performed um, to compare the 3D dose distribution from the Monte Carlo and from the film. For a 1% and 0.5 millimeter uh, criteria, the grid had 99% of all points passing and this 11 millimeter square had 96% all passing. So the a visualization of the gamma analysis for the 1% 0.5 millimeter criteria shown in these two plots below the red regions correspond to regions that have failed, whereas blue, green, and yellow correspond to regions that have passed. Um, now onto incorporation of this phase space into the treatment planning system. So incorporating the, the grid phase space uh, can be done through the graf graphical interface of the smart plan treatment planning system, and this is a fairly easy process. Um, the grid field incident on a block of water uh, from within the treatment planning system can be seen on the left here. Um, now, the main differences in the dose calculation uh, between the dose calculation used in this work and the dose calculation used in the treatment planning system uh, is that in the treatment planning system, a photon splitting value of 200 is used, which is a variance reduction technique and this wasn't used in, in this work. Uh, however, in this work, we have a, a weight rejection, which removes some um, fat particles, uh, which uh, can skew the dose distribution if uh, some uh, variance reduction techniques were used. So this isn't incorporated into the treatment planning system dose calculation, but um, there were methods around this that was managed to solve. Now, the differences in the dose distribution to a water phantom was analyzed but, uh, and compared between the two separate dose calculations, and the results agreed within uncertainty of the simulation. Now, onto a comparison to other preclinical grids. Uh, so, Timothy Johnson and others produced the, the most comparable grids. The main difference was that we produced trials from casting cerebin, whereas they machined theirs from lead. The, um, we had diverging holes, whereas was theirs were, were not. The open area to blocked area ratio was slightly higher on ours. Um, 
and the peak to valley and peak to valley ratio and the output factor were fairly comparable. Uh, the reason ours is, is slightly higher was because of the the high, greater hole radii. Uh, I assume. So for future work, uh, um, the more work is needed to commission the process of grid therapy. Uh, so there could be some work on assessing the repeatability of mounting, uh, account for any systematic shifts in, in the with respect to the isocenter, um, assess the simulation's accuracy near material inhomogeneities, and for future production of grids, it's advised that the uh, there should be a hole in the central uh, beam axis so that dose prescription in the treatment planning system. Uh, is, is a little bit more straightforward than it is right now. So hopefully this project can uh, contribute to the ability to perform radiobiological research on uh, on grid therapy and, and help the, the treatment modality a little bit more. So a very big thanks to my supervisors, Martin, Pejman and David. Uh, thank you to Matt for his ideas regarding the grid manufacturing and for his help uh, implementing directional Bremsstrahlung in Monte Carlo, Munir for his help with portal imagery, Rebecca for her help with the collimator measurements and mouse CTs, Brendan for his help with grid manufacturing, Blake and the Telethon Kids Institute for allowing me to use the extract machine, uh, Gabor for his help with film scanning, Andrew for his assistance with laser cutting, uh, my my dad Keith for his help with grid machining, and then Marsha Riley and Gavin for their assistance with three D printing and Monte Carlo simulations. Okay, thank you. Any questions? It's great. Thanks very much, Marcus. Um, we have um, five minutes for questions. Yes, lots of encouragement. <laughs> any questions? Well, it's really clear. I'm, I'm not sure if there's any questions. Okay, so a few questions. I can see Martin first. You can go, Martin. Uh, I just feel obliged to ask a question. So if there are other, other people that want to ask questions, they should go first. That's fine. <laughs> um, Tegan? Uh, thanks very much, um, Marcus. That was very clear. Um, now, the you might have mentioned this earlier. Um, were you wanting to do other whole ratios or you were just trying to get the smallest you could manufacture or were you just trying to test to find one that would work and see? Like, is this is this something that you think other people would do with um, like fewer holes or smaller diameters or things like that? Yeah, so, so with the grid manufacturing, uh, I basically tried to produce the the smallest uh, possible hole spacing uh, with the 0 0.7 millimeter radii holes. So the 0 0.7 millimeter radii holes was was determined based on the 180 different grid arrangements that I um, analyzed, and that seemed to be a good value. Anything below that seemed to be producing an output factor that was too low, and uh, so, with the grid manufacturing, which is which is, um, I'll show here. Um, there was a problem with casting the cerebend into into holes that were a spaced closer than this. Um, so, so this is, yeah. I basically just produced a method to to create grids. Rather than, yeah. Does yeah, that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, so demonstrating what's practical, what's doable, um, yeah. while also meeting uh, suggested requirements. Yeah, no, that's good. Thank you. Let's get so, Martin. I'm sure it was terrific, Marcus. It's an amazing amount of work you did there, and I really liked the way you recruited people to help, including your own father. It was a <laughs> very creative. And I guess when, when you're using this practically, how, how would you align the animal with the 
that particular color print color better. With, with the open field, you can actually take a a portal image um, with that field in place, and you can take an image with with the EPID on the small animal machine. It'll show the field, but that may not work with this one. Could you speculate how you might align the animal in this case? Oh, so you're saying that let's say we were irradiating with a a, a ten or one centimeter collimator. You can actually use the one centimeter collimator to to do the CT. Is that is that what you mean? Uh, no, you can't do the CT, but you can take a portal image so you can show where that field is irradiating oh. in the animal. But oh, okay. I'll probably put you on the spot here because you may not have uh, contemplated this up to this point. But um, it, this will be an issue if we if we want to align an animal um, with this grid collimator. We will have to think about how that alignment can happen. Yes. Hmm. So, so you think there will be a problem with taking a portal image using this? I, I don't see how. I don't, this think, is... I don't think we can take a portal image with that that field. We wouldn't see anything. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. okay. Hmm. That's right. Hmm. So Marcus, I remember you had some comparison between um, your Monte Carlo and Tiden planning, because it's based on, uh, but they both were based on Monte Carlo. Do you have the results here or not? In this yeah. Slide? So, so these, so these are the results here. Oh. Um, so I only have shown the Y profile comparisons and the um, percentage depth dose in the in a water block. Um, so the the uncertainties are are considerable based on the treatment planning system only having um, a set amount of uh, it has a limit on how long you can simulate a phase space for. So that's fun. That's great. Thanks very much, Marcos. And there is no more comments or questions which is great and um, all the best for all of you guys well done brilliant have a nice weekend everyone and thanks everyone for attending this